40% of people with autism have special abilities. Just for a moment, picture yourself sitting down at a piano and playing a classical piece without ever having had any lessons. Or imagine you fly over New York City in a helicopter and then walk into a studio and draw the skyline of New York City in every intricate detail just from memory. Or what if you could remember every math problem you had ever seen in your life? That would have come in handy with the SATs, <laughs> right? But I'm not here to pitch a superhero movie, no worries. I'm here to talk about real people. Derek Paravicini is a self-taught pianist who can replicate any complex musical arrangement after only hearing it once. Stephen Wiltshire is an artist who flies over cities all over the world in a helicopter, and then he walks into a studio and draws the cityscape, the skyline, in every intricate detail, just from memory. And Jake Burnett is a math genius. He was accepted to study astrophysics at Purdue University at the age of 10. And he can remember every math problem he has ever seen. And the one thing that all three of them have in common is that they have autism. Chances are you know someone who has autism. And that person may not be anything like Derek, Stephen, or Jake. There are significant challenges in autism. Your ear may still be ringing from that tantrum you witnessed. Maybe you have a bitter taste in your mouth from just thinking about that kid that ruined your perfect dinner out. Or maybe you feel a pit in your stomach every time you hear the word autism. The challenges are significant. And this is why we focus on them a lot. But we need to change that. We need to refocus. We need to look at ability. When we shift our focus from disability to ability, we begin to appreciate our neurological differences. And once we appreciate these differences, we realize that we need all brains on deck to truly live up to a full human potential. And when I say all brains, I mean people with autism, without autism, people with dyslexia, anxiety, Down syndrome, I mean all brains. But I will talk about autism here today because that's what I know about most. Over the past 15 years, I've worked with children, young people and adults with autism as a researcher and a uh, reading expert, a professor. And I've experienced these abilities. Not every person with autism has a superhuman ability, but every person with autism has an ability. And when we look at these abilities, um, we unfortunately, when we diagnose autism, we don't look at these abilities, we only look at impairments. We use this manual, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Health Disorders to diagnose autism. And this manual has 41 deficits listed in there that are commonly associated with autism. But there's zero abilities in there, zero. Although we know that 40% of people with autism have special abilities. And many of these abilities are commonly associated with autism. I'm thinking about a lot of individuals I worked with over the years, but one, one of my little guys comes to mind, Conrad, who was a six-year-old boy, he was very shy, and he always came in, his head down on the ground. It was hard for him to look into people's eyes. And he was oversensitive to everyday sounds, especially cars driving by bothered him, and he would cover his ears. Now this sensitivity, is listed as an impairment in this manual. And it's true, it can be bothersome, it can impair his learning, it can 
uh, be uncomfortable, but Conrad will also be the first one who will hear that car approaching. He will be the first one who will tell his friends that quiet electric car is coming up. Conrad also has an intense focus on his special area of interest, dinosaurs. He loves dinosaurs. And he, when he talks, he talks about dinosaurs a lot. It's hard to stop him. But, you know, I didn't mind because whenever he talked about dinosaurs, he looked me straight into the eye and I could see his beautiful face. And this uh, intensity of focus is also listed as an impairment in this manual. It is listed as a hyperfocus that's abnormal in intensity. And that's true. Uh, it can get annoying when he talks about dinosaurs a lot, but this hyperfocus also makes him an expert in his field, in the field of dinosaurs. And I bet that Steve Jobs had hyperfocus when he built his brand. We need to rebrand disability and disorders because hyperfocus is an ingredient for success. And one more thing about Conrad, he was a master in assembling puzzles. He could put them together quicker than anybody has, I've ever seen. And this ability to put together puzzles very quickly just made him stand out from all the kids I've worked with. So what if we, what are we telling our, our children, our friends, our students, when we only look at their impairments? Did we only define them as people by the deficits? Or that we feel sorry for them or we expect less from them? Do we assume that somebody who flaps their arms when they're excited cannot accomplish anything in life? Or do we conclude that somebody who's fixated on Star Wars or history or neurosurgery or dinosaurs can only be a nerd, not an expert? What if instead we focus on, we look at these behaviors as an expression of human neurodiversity? Human neurodiversity is a biological fact. It just states that all of our brains work differently. And these variations in the human genome, in fact, enrich our gene pool. Early humans with autistic traits may have been the ones that helped ensure our survival. Conrad's ancestors may have been the ones that helped ensure the survival of their tribes because they were the ones that heard that rustling in the leaves first. And Conrad's intense, uh, Conrad's mastery of puzzles, he can put them together so quickly, may have been an ability that was inherited over generations from his ancestors who were really good at assessing vast landscapes to determine where food and water sources are located. So we need all kinds of minds to solve our life's problems. We need to learn how to grow and nurture and harvest these abilities instead of trying to eliminate our neurological differences. And when I think about that, I think about college, because that's where I spend a lot of time at. We need to turn college disability centers into centers for neurodiversity. Right now, college disability centers are places where students with any kind of diagnosis go to get testing accommodations. We're missing opportunities here. First of all, we're sending students to a place that labels them as disabled, and then we ask them to give us their best performance. Many students do not register with disability services because of the stigma and the blow to their self-confidence that are common side effects of spending time at the disability center. So 
we need to go beyond testing accommodations and we need to develop these centers for neurodiversity as incubators for innovative ideas where creativity can flow freely and where out of the box thinking is rewarded. We need to tap into these extraordinary minds to give us the best ideas instead of asking them to adhere to an average, a norm that they won't be able to adhere to. And let's face it, the average brain is not the brain that advances humanity. Albert Einstein didn't have an average brain. Who knows, maybe we will find the next big idea, the next Bill Gates at a center for neurodiversity. I want to turn these centers into places where all students go, the, the hangout place at a college campus, where students who feel socially awkward in a regular classroom are the leaders, where they are listened to, and where all students go to learn about our neurological differences and why they're cool. Imagine what that will do to the stigma attached to neurological differences. And imagine what that will do to the self-confidence of neurodivergent learners. Imagine how that will open up the minds of all of our students, our next generation. So when we accept that the average is not a goal to aspire to, we open ourselves to the extraordinary. And when we move from disability to ability, we unleash the brain power we need to create an exceptional future. And when we let all minds be brilliant, we truly advance as humans. So chances are you're thinking of someone that you know that has autism at work, at school, or in your neighborhood. And if you're a teacher, look for ways how every student can contribute, how each of your students can shine. If you are in a position to hire, examine the advantages of a neurodiverse workforce. And if you're a parent, well, if you're a parent, I don't have to tell you anything because you know how able your child is. You just need all of our support. You need all of us to stop staring and start smiling a friendly smile when we see your kid throw a tantrum in the supermarket or at our favorite restaurant. You need all of us to believe in your child as much as you do. Who knows, it may be an autistic brain again that will help ensure survival. In an era of systems engineering and artificial intelligence and machine learning, these are areas of strength in autistic people. And these are fields that we need to survive. So let's call all brains on deck and let's appreciate our neurological differences and let's embrace neurodiversity. Thank you. <laughs>